takes a minute. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. As often happens with this show, one guest is referred by a previous guest. So before I introduce the main event, the chef du jour, I'm going to introduce the chef who referred him. And he's an extraordinarily talented plant-based chef. He's had restaurants, he has best-selling books, and you might know him as the lead chef at Vegetarian Summerfest, which hasn't happened in a couple of years. And he he's as cool as a cucumber. I'm so in awe of the way he's able to run an event like that and not get stressed and create delicious, beautiful, healthy food. He can do everything. He can do raw. He can do cooked. He can do SOS free. He can do gluten free. There is nothing that this guy can't do. Please welcome Mark Rinfeld. Nice to see you again. So good to see you again, AJ. Thanks for having us back. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce you and our audience to the brand new Vegan Fusion Culinary Academy here in Boulder, Colorado. We're going to do just a quick scan of the school for everyone to see on your show for the first time. Uh, this is our state-of-the-art facility where we offer our main program is a four-month training for aspiring chefs in the for, for entering for a career in the plant-based culinary world. So whether they're looking to be a health coach or private chef, open their own restaurant or food truck, become a caterer, consultant, menu and recipe developer, Wherever people want to go in their plant-based culinary career, we're gearing that four-month program to really train them, show it, show them what it's like to be in a professional kitchen, how to move around, all the equipment they're familiar with. Uh, we have an amazing team of culinary instructors. Uh, we have uh, with us Chef Jamie Nealon, who's doing the camera. She'll give you a quick hello. Um, Chef April Stam, who she taught at the French Culinary Institute in New York City for over eight years and has really helped us create a program that's of the highest level, the same as you would find at the CIA or the Cordon Bleu or any of the, the best culinary schools uh, in the country. Uh, we also offer a selection of home cook classes. So we have this summer, we're doing uh, weekend workshops and five day trainings uh, geared towards the home chef. Uh, Post COVID, we'll be having more one night classes, date nights, uh, vegan desserts, SOS meals, you name it, we're gonna be having it at the school. And again, I'm really excited and we definitely look forward to welcoming you in person and via Zoom to uh, share your magic with our students as well. And uh, I'm very honored and excited to introduce uh, Chef Ron Pekarski. He was actually extremely influential in my culinary career when I started cooking uh, in the early 90s in a health food store in San Diego. I was pretty much self-taught. I loved cooking as a child, but I didn't have any training. And uh, Chef Ron's books were kind of a cornerstone for me of how I learned various techniques and the skills in uh, plant-based cuisine. He's uh, the first uh, certified vegan executive chef. He's what, the first vegan to win uh, medals in the Culinary Olympics, matched up against non-vegan food. So he's a true, for anyone who's familiar with the evolution of the plant-based culinary scene, Chef, Chef Ron is definitely an icon and a mentor. So it just so happens that he lives in Boulder. He's been a guest presenter at our school. And uh, I would love to introduce Chef Ron. I just, before he gets started, Jamie, why don't you come up and she's just gonna share a little with Jamie is also one of our amazing instructors and you could, uh, whatever, sure. And then uh, after Chef Jamie introduces herself, we'll hand it off to Chef Ron. Hi everybody, my name is Jamie. I'm a chef here at Vegan Fusion Culinary Academy. Really excited to be a part of the team. I came from Houston, Texas to open the school with Chef Mark and Chef April. Um, I'm helping with our professional aspiring chef program. And then like Chef Mark was saying, I'm also gonna be helping with our summer classes that are starting this summer. So if anybody out there wants to take some vegan classes, immerse themselves in some five day or three day workshops. We'll be here this summer. But most importantly, really excited about the star of the show today, Chef Ron Parsky. He's been in the kitchen with us a few times in our aspiring chef program. And like Chef Mark was saying, he is um, just amazing to work with. He's a plethora of knowledge and so excited to have him here with us and you today. So without further ado, please Chef Ron. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. Wow, you are you sound like you're culinary royalty, Chef Ron. Uh, I've been around the block and you can see I read a book on it last night. Which I mean, yeah, yeah, I um, I got involved in vegetarian cuisine when uh, shortly after becoming a certified meat cutter in 1976 because I was over 200 pounds. I started smoking as in uh, sixth grade. I had walk in the morning twice, almost died from it. Uh, so I had all the things going against me. My parents had all, a lot of common traditions also. And I had a new awakening that, hey, if I didn't change my lifestyle, I was going to end up uh, dying very young and be really unhealthy. So I became a vegan in 1976 uh, for health reasons. And I am now 73 years old. I uh, take no medications. I can weigh bench press, weight press 500 pounds. So I'm doing okay for 72. And to me, that was the best kickback on this. And that's what brought me into this food. But I just became a student for, uh, just graduated from culinary school. And shortly after that, graduated from meat cutting school and became a vegan. And this was 1976. So I felt like I was in the middle of the desert. There was no soy milk, it was hard to even find tofu. So I started building from scratch. And so what I'm gonna to do today is walk you through a few is it on? Is it on? <laughs> That's I mean I didn't even know there was I didn't even know there was such a thing as a culinary Olympics. Yeah, so that was started back in nineteen in eighteen seventy-six. I should say eighteen uh, 96 and they celebrated their first centennial in obviously 1996 and that was the first time after 20 years of competing as a vegan in the culinary olympics that's the first time that they had a vegan category because i wasn't competing with the vegan category this was i was competing against meat and seafood and all the traditional cuisines so what I did is when I came back from the Olympics, I decided that I was going to take what I did in the Olympics and put it on America's table. And that's when I started Deep with the Scene, which is the first vegan food service company. And then as a colonologist, I started developing the products of some of which I'm going to show you today with the idea of bringing these foods into the food service segment. The biggest problem in food service when I was working back in the 80s is that the food was very expensive and it was very labor intense. So I thought, okay, there's got to be a solution to that. And that's what Eat the Cuisine went about doing, creating speech match types of proteins and baking mixes and stuff that would basically make it easy for the uh, chefs to cook this kind of product, things that they could just build into their menu. And so what I'm going to do today is walk you through some of these dishes. I understand all this, that you want a royal food, but I had a senior moment, I didn't realize that you wanted sugar free. So we can get some sugar in here. Yeah, can I just say something? Because people want to hear you. Maybe you can move the microphone up a little higher on your chef coat. I don't know if you're a soft spoken person, but it's it, the sound people are ha having a little bit of trouble hearing you. And then while you're doing that, I just want to say, uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions, which you can answer once the microphone is fixed. Yes, guys, we're, we're on it. I see your I see your posts in the chat. I'm wearing headphones, so I'm not having trouble hearing him. But yes, we're going to get that fixed. We're going to have the microphone closer to his uh, mouth. And then I want to learn more about this vegan culinary Olympics that he participated in and what he made to actually beat actual uh, meat and fish okay. making. You have to talk for me to hear you. Is that better? I, I hear fine. So, guys, is that better? He needs to talk. Here, try to project a little. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is start off today with making uh, a vegan cake. And I'm going to add uh, some of the egg milk. This is a new cuisine product. And it's basically a combination of soy milk, hydrocolloids, and a little black salt. And soy milk powder, organic soy milk powder. We're going to add that, the sugar, and the baking powder with a touch of salt. We're going to mix all of that together. So this is just like a baking mix. And instead of using um, oil, what I'm going to do is use coconut uh, cream. I need to get a little cream in it. And the cream, what the cream does is it uh, tenderizes the texture, keep it as sharp and smooth, and cook it in here like a short cookie, a short cookie. 
mix in between the oil, the critical tenderness. So I just added the water, the soy milk, and the uh, vanilla. And that's how easy it is to make it, that quick and easy. Hey, Chef Ron, do you remember what you made for your winning culinary Olympic medal? Yeah, I did uh, a number of dishes. I competed over 20 years. So I, uh, one of the dishes I did, I'm going to step off the kitchen wall here, was a kalakina alakina pita. I made a soy grits. Let me just have a more water. Uh, with soy grits and uh, a number of spices, tofu, and then I took that and I wrapped it in a tofu pate. And uh, I did a whole just, it's interesting, this one of the, I won the silver medal in pastries doing the sweet side of sensitive sweets and all of the desserts and all the pastries were made with vegetables. So I did not, I competed five times uh, over 20 year period. Well, then when we do an Iron and, Chef on this show, maybe you'll come back. And now I'm, now I'm going to put uh, into a lime pan. I would normally oil and flour, but because we don't have any oil, I'm putting it into a uh, lime pan. Into the oven for 20 minutes. And that's how easy it is to do these dishes. They're not made very poor. And the thing about the uh, egg is that it, it gives the uh, vegan pastries tend to have, a, they don't have the, the chime. If you need a cake made with egg, the kind of spongy, well, you don't get that sponginess in the vegan cake. It kind of chimes it into a paste, and that's okay. But with the egg mix, it gives it more structure. So when you bite into it, it's almost like a bit of egg. You can press it and it pops right back because it's got that uh, structure from the hydrocolloids from the egg. So next, we're going to make the ice cream. Did you, where did you go to culinary school, Chef Ron? The train moved. <laughs> Chef Ron, where did you go to culinary? Yeah, yeah. See, see, Mark. I, I, I went to Washburn Culinary Institute. Mark, I, I'm getting your text. For some reason, you you are here so clearly, Mark. But for some reason, Chef Ron's sound it's it's a little tinny and echoey, um, and I don't yeah. know I don't know why we can hear you so well, Mark. It yes. could be the yeah. mic. I'm gonna turn the mic off and just we'll ask Chef Ron to just project a little. Okay. Yeah, because that's creating a. Because we can hear you and so we can hear. Talk, is this coming okay? Yeah, yeah we, we can hear um, Mark okay and we can hear the other chef when they talk, but for some reason it, they're saying it's tinny and echoey. I have headphones, so I'm not having a problem, but the live studio audience is. So thanks for that. And guys, thanks sure. for letting me know. Yeah, I think the uh, the mic is creating some reverb, so we'll just. Okay, so I'll just speak up. Yeah, pretend I'm 100 feet away. Okay. Good, so what I'm going to do next is make the uh, ice cream. Now, ice cream is usually made in a, in a, with an ice cream machine. And, uh, there's a, what they call the soft serve. What they do is they in, inject air into the ice cream. That's what they call it an overrun, like a 100% overrun where they're taking a cup of the mix and turning it into two cups of ice cream. What I'm going to do is make a really simple version here. And I'm going to get some of that overrun by I'm putting just all the coconut cream in here. And then the cashews. Two tablespoons of cashews. Vanilla. Salt. Pepper powder. And water. These recipes are in my cookbook, the Tasa for Vegetarian Cookbook for Professional Chefs and Inspired Cooks, which is written to teach you how to cook and eat food. It's not just uh, another cookbook, it's a cookbook that really 
teaches technique. And then I'm going to add the sugar. But with the sugar, I want to make a point here, knowing that you don't need a lot of sugar or any at all. Not all sugar is vegan. Uh, cane sugar is bone char. And I believe the beet sugar is not bone char. But if you don't know and you buy white sugar, just buy uh, a natural white sugar, like the sh sugar cane here's an organic and I'm using right here from Whole Foods. And that sugar is guaranteed a bone char because it's off color, so it wasn't char. So I'm putting all of that in there. And next, just put it to the blender. Now this is a warring blender, and this is the type that it really gives the, uh, it's really powerful. So I'll pulverize this in just about two minutes. It's going to be Hey, Mark, while he's blending, is your school also have a virtual component in addition to an in-person component? Uh, at the moment, we do, at the moment, we are not offering a virtual component. We're really focusing on the in-person classes. We've been uh, really diligently uh, observing all the COVID protocols and wanting to create a super safe environment for people. So that's been our main focus is really working on getting the the in-person environment uh, where we want it to be. And uh, we're really happy with uh, being able to do that and have be able to taste students' foods and offer feedback in real time. So at the moment, we're all, we're all live all the time. Wow, so you have to taste everything they make. Uh, as much as possible. <laughs> we probably all put on a few pounds since we started. <laughs> that is so funny. That must be tough. I mean, I do, you seem like a very kind person. So if it's not good, what do you say to them? Uh, we would say. So uh, we're, um, uh, oh, so oops, hold on. We uh, so we uh, basically uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of just finding something positive about something, a food. And so I'll look to see what it, I like about it. And then I'll offer some constructive feedback. So. I try to do a balanced approach. Has it ever we're, been? We're not. Has we're it ever been? Old. Sorry. Has it ever been oh. so bad that you couldn't think of anything good to say, like other than, "Hey, you did a nice job cleaning up your station." <laughs> right. Nice try. Or we're, we're not the chefs that throw the food off the, the table if it's not good. So anyway, what I what I've done here, though, I've learned this, and what you're looking for is to make sure that the uh, nuts are completely ground. So what I do is I take them and I rub it in my, between my fingers and there is no grit. If there's grit, that needs, means it needs to blend a little bit longer. Now I'll just pour it into a, a container and then go into the freezer. And once this freezes, if you want to get more aeration into it, you can take it out and put it in a, a mixing bowl with the paddle and just beat it, and then it'll not, it'll put more air into it also. So this is ice cream ready to go. All I have to do is we put it to our, into a freezer. So next, we're going to see how quick these things work. They're really easy recipes. Now the next one, everybody's probably familiar with aquafaba. So what I'm going to do here is make a floating aisle. And the floating aisle is just basically a meringue and a cream sauce, uh, laying on a vanilla cream sauce. And it's a classical French type dish, European, and it's just very light. It's a very spring type dish. So here I have Chef Ron, do you use any equipment like an Instant Pot or an air fryer in your daily cooking? Uh, I've used air fryers. Uh, I use Instant Pot. I have an Instant Pot, yes. And uh, I do, when I, when I use oil, I should quantify that. I use oil um, just for the technique, like when I'm sauteing, I'm going to do a water, I do the water saute on the onions and the carrots. And I'm just going to scrub the zucchini 
But when I use oil, I usually just put just enough to line the pan so that when I saute, it feeds off the flavor. Because sauteing, when you cook something to get the flavor out, you've got to cook it until you cook the vegetable to death to extract out the flavor. And that's fine if you're doing it in the sauce, but if you're doing a vegetable that you want to serve, uh, say a, a sauteed zucchini, you turn it to mush before you cook it out. Now you can just lightly steam it, but if you steam it and then you compare that to saute, you'll notice that the flavor just pops. And I'm not talking about a lot of it. I'm talking maybe a gram per serving or something. And when I was in culinary school, I went to Washburn, as I went to Washburn Culinary Institute in Chicago. And um, when I was doing the sauce one day, the chef said to me, uh, he tasted the Provence sauce sauce and he said, did you follow the instructions? And I said, uh, yes. He said, did you saute it? And I said, no. So I didn't follow the instructions. He said, yes, that's it again. Hold on. We have, a, we have an interruption okay. in service. They're changing okay. technology, guys, to bring yeah. you the best possible sound. So Mark is moving. He's not only the executive chef, but he is the executive tech today. <laughs> this should this should be better. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do next is make the uh, meringue. And I'm going to start off with uh, putting the uh, garbanzo juice in the pan. And then... Does anybody know who the chef is that invented aquafaba? Pardon me? Does anybody know who the chef is that not, not invented aquafaba because it was always in the can, but like who started using it for things like meringues? Somebody had to think of it first. I don't know the name of the person, but I know it originated in Italy. Yeah, so I don't, yeah, I don't know the name of the person, but Italy is, the, is where it uh, was uh, invented. So. And the thing about aquafaba is that it, it foams up, it whips up, but it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, hold up if you put it under um, heat or if you try to do anything with it, heat and tender, it kind of breaks down. Even if you let it set, it will break down. So what you want to do is put structure to it. So when I'm making this meringue, I'm going to add some instant soy pudding to it. And it has cold green, it has starches in it, and it has soy milk. All those things work together to create protein structure in the stone so that when I put it under the barrier, it just doesn't collapse and, and, and fall flat. So it's starting to form up a little bit less. I can use this to make a, a number of things. I'm using it in case it's a, I, I used it in a cake, and now I'm using it in a meringue, and I'm going to use it to melt the zucchini pancakes next. It, it gives you an idea of the versatility of this product. It's the easier to send it to the uh, dust bag. The difference is it's a dry mix, and it costs about 275 uh, pounds on Amazon. It's a two pound case, and it comes in these four bags. I saw about eight of them in a case. And, and uh, each one of those will make about two pounds of eggs. So two pounds of eggs will cost you about $30, $30 uh, in, in just days. And you can get that for a couple of hours. So it's 275 a pound for this egg, it's eight dollars for the other. And just egg is really good as a scramble, so I'm not saying you don't buy it. It just has a different function. This function is more for cooking and culinary application, it just made it more sustainable. And you can use it in some of these two and a half hours. So now that it's got this color, I'm going to do it, turn it off, and you can see that it's got some foam in it. And then now I'm going to add the uh, egg mix and sugar, uh, almond flavor, and vanilla. And Letting out slow. Now it's now it's just a matter of waiting for it to peak. Now I'm just waiting for it uh, to peak, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to make the cream sauce for it. The cream sauce is 
time, there are lots of people. There's a moraine in the uh, in my cookbook that has the use of a coconut cream, but it's not a moraine that you could bake in a two cents. But I'm doing the use of coconut cream and uh, uh, puffed rice. It's a puffed rice. It's, I'll think about the name of that and it'll make really light when I set that on it. So that, that is an easy sugar cake to be able to get from my food. And I also have the vanilla cream recipes in the book. And you can easily substitute the song I think so substitute it. That's in the treatment for the uh, for the uh, uh, sugar. So I'm going to add a little liquid to this at a time. I don't want to add it all. I don't want, I don't want it to lump up on me. It's instant gel, so you don't have to cook it. So I'll be able to cook it. So I'll Look at all the lights and then put the final line. Now I could add lemon flavor to this. The fat of vanilla will cool already and I'm leaving it vanilla. You want an almond vanilla in the meringue. And then you have it. A piece of vanilla cream sauce. And You see how it holds up. Now this is stable. This is stable enough to put into an oven and bake versus the traditional aquafaba, which does not have the structure. If you look at the structure of it, you can see that it's got a much brighter color, much more intense color. Uh, you can see how it holds up. It holds up like an aquafaba uh, right after it's flipped, but this will hold up like this tomorrow. So when you're working with it, you'll see a difference in that, in that consistency. So now this is ready uh, for plating. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to get into the plating uh, at the very end here. So next, our well, final dish is going to be the uh, zucchini pancake. Now this is, what I did here is I water sauteed these vegetables. Now, as I mentioned, I like to saute with oil, but here I did it with um, uh, just water. And then what I did is I put enough, just uh, enough water to cover the vegetables. So some maybe, maybe a quarter of an inch of water. And I let it cook until the onions turn translucent. When they were translucent, I stopped. But I wanted to reduce the water down to nothing. So when I cook it, I cook it until there is no water in the pan. That's crucial. No water in the pans. Otherwise, it'll wet out your product and disrupt your formula. So for the zucchini now, what I'm going to do is just sweat the I found a way of doing this that uh, basically cooks the zucchini in its own uh, moisture. So I got this piece Burners work really fast. So when the zucchini starts to sweat, starts to steam, then I know it's pretty much cooked. You gotta stay with it because if you don't stay with it, 30 seconds it's burned. Meanwhile, I'm gonna check the case. And while that's going on, what I'm going to do is start on the mixing uh, herb mix. So we've got the water here. And 
struggle what you want to choose. It's a very, very simple recipe. Very simple. Uh, add the, this is just a plain egg mix, it's one ounce of this. Here's the water. Well, these are starting, you, know, you can see them starting to brown a little bit, I'm going to pull them off now. You can see the steam coming off. They are cooked. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. And let's pick this up. You just want to get all the lumps out of it. It's set for a few minutes. When it sets to hydrocolloid, it starts to melt a little bit quick. And that's one of the advantages of this is that it's, it's a culinary product, just the egg is like water, you put in a pan. It, um, it's, it's a liquid and it floats and it scrambles up perfectly. It actually scrambles better than, than Nico Cuisine's egg. And that's why they call it a scramble. The application of it, though, is not as diverse. It can do some of the things this egg can do. You see how it's starting to, starting to form the ridges, it's starting to set up a little bit. I can move along a little quickly and put the cheese in there now. Once the water is in there and the Hydrocolloids are activated. It's pretty safe to uh, add other ingredients to it without disrupting, disrupting the. Uh, when you say cheese, okay. though, you mean non dairy vegan cheese, right? Yeah, this is a vegan cheese. This is a cheese uh, from uh, Dial. Dial cheese. It's a Canadian company. They have mozzarella, they have uh, American cheese. And I'm going to add the. Um, Vegetables now. And now we'll add It's going up the set just for a few moments, but I got everything in there. You can see the steam coming off that. So what are your must-haves in the kitchen? Pardon me? What are, what are your must-haves in the kitchen? Must-haves? Yeah, what, what's in your own personal kitchen that um, people must have? Yeah, that's a loaded question because my kitchen is both the colonologist's kitchen and a personal kitchen. So upstairs is the personal kitchen, tofu, tempeh, seitan. Um, I have my analogs, of course, and I do enjoy those every now and then if I'm night. Getting enough protein, I'll grab an analog. Beans, pulses, a lot of beans and pulses and whole grains. And um, traditional herbs and spices, I, soy milk, uh, coconut cream, have all the traditional stuff. And then when I'm making, when I'm cooking, I, I'll make like an espanol sauce or glute or whatever. And I got all these sauces and stuff sitting in my refrigerator, maybe a half a dozen sauces. So at night when my wife says, what's for dinner? Um, I got all these sauces to pull from, all of these uh, different uh, uh, proteins to pull from. It's very easy for me to pull together a dinner uh, 30 minutes after not knowing what I'm going to, 30 minutes before I'm serving it, not knowing what I'm going to serve because I just got so much food moving in and out. A lot of fresh produce. I, I would say 70% of my diet is fresh produce and the other 30% is the, the refined processed foods. Just the way I eat, and that's why I say short on the protein. Broccoli has more protein per calorie than does um, uh, meat. But you have to eat a whole lot of broccoli to get the same amount of meat. So that's why I like beans. When I need a quick go to type food, I got quick beans sitting in the refrigerator. I just pull out a cup and just eat them. It's just good, healthy food. Yeah. What, what's your favorite hat to wear? Uh, recipe creator, chef, a competitor, culinary instructor, product I'd say inventor. Culinary artist. I'd say culinary artist. It's sort of a broad scope. It's looking at the art of eating, looking at the art of cooking, looking at the art of nutrition, 
So you could be a vegan and still eat unhealthy. It's not a free line ticket to being healthy. So uh, I look at art, I look at this as an art and I come from being an artist. I was doing commission paintings when I was in high school and uh, I was doing oil painting. I grew up loving to create with my hands and I would make ships out of bark and I was, was born in, I was born in the country where we were poor and I had to get real creative. I would take bark from the trees and make, make a sailing ship or something. So I had this artistic inclination and I never thought uh, it would end up here, but whoever thought they'd end up where they're at, you know, where we're at right now. I mean, it's just life, it kind of moved from one moment to the next. So on to the, um, just use this thing. I'm just gonna let this, now look how stiff this is since it's set. Now this is what I'm looking, what I'm talking about in terms of giving the kind of consistency that you want in an egg. So this is a little thicker than an egg would usually be. So now, I'm going to just empty this water out of this pan. So who are some chefs that inspired you? And it's okay if they're not vegan, because I think you can learn from everyone. Who are, who are some chefs that inspired you? Um, the chef that I probably, he's long since passed, but Antoine Caron uh, from the 18th century. He was the, really the father of French cuisine. And he was born uh, of a poor family uh, during the French Revolution. He was nine years old when his parents couldn't afford to keep him in the house and told him to go out and get a job. He ended up working in a New York, uh, in a New York, in a French chop house during the French Revolution. And he worked his way up. And he never took a job that was easy. He always took a job that would really give him the ability to excel in his art. And that, that person in, in culinary history is probably the person that influenced me the most. I would say the uh, person that influenced me the most right now uh, in, um, in the modern era is the, the master chefs that I've worked with. From uh, the Culinary Olympic chef, Master Chef Ozil is one, Master Chef Con uh, Contriciani, Chef No Cullen. Uh, no Cullen was so talented that he could get on a plane and fly to, to Europe and conceive an idea that he wanted to present in the competition, present it and win a gold. He never won less than a gold in his life. These are the people that I worked with. And, and, I, and the one thing they taught me is that you're forever a student. No matter how intelligent you are, no matter how much you know, you never know it all. And these guys act like that. I mean, when I'm with them, I'm sitting at their feet, but they're also asking me questions about my food because they don't know what I know about being food. So it's really that kind of a synergy. But the master chefs and the chefs that I just mentioned are, are a few of the people that inspire me. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So now we're gonna go to uh, making the um, pancake. I'm going to take a layer of this mix. You can scoop it or you can bulk it. I'm just going to do one on the pan here. What if it warms up a little bit? When the water evaporates, I know it's, it's hot enough. Vegan cuisine, though, is really uh, come a long way since I was, um, since I became a vegan. But one of the things that's come up in the nutrition side a lot, and this is one of the things I bring into my products, if you notice with this egg mix, it's a processed food, but what am I adding to it? All of these whole foods. And that's what I look at with my proteins. I make ground beef mix, I make roasted vegetable sauces, uh, roasted vegetable meatloaf with it, I make, uh, uh, a bolognese sauce. Um, I use them with vegetables, with whole foods, and they're designed to be used that way. So they become carriers. I use a lot of beans in these foods also. They're an excellent carrier for beans. Hey, I know what I want to ask you next. I actually asked this to somebody recently. If you were going to be executed, well, not, I mean, you didn't do the crime, but let's say, you know, the idea of the last meal, you know, they offer you in prison. What would yeah. your, what would you choose as your last meal? Well, that's a good question. Broccoli and roasted potatoes. <laughs> that's my lunch every single day? 
broccoli and roasted potatoes. And if you think, I, I love that. That's quite often a meal for me at times. I make fresh roasted Yukons. I roast them to the point where they caramelize and they, and they just turn buttery. Because in roasted potato, you got to get it right to that perfection point. And then I just slightly saute some broccoli with some onions and garlic. And I eat those two. And potatoes are a complete protein. And they're a good source of protein. And broccoli is, a, as, as I mentioned, just mentioned, it's got more protein per calorie than, than meat. So, um, my, to my point, uh, it's whole foods and it's just very comforting to me. And sometimes if I've got it, I've got my SBO sauce, I want to make that a little bit on there too. I didn't know you did. Well, I love what you picked because that's about my lunch every single day for the last 10 years and I never get tired. Often I use sweet potatoes, but yes, potatoes yeah. and broccoli. So see, I'm using a no-stick pan. This so just really works well with this. So I'm just gonna flip it over and uh, let it finish cooking. And you can tell it springs back. You can, mine's more to turn that off and so Make sure the cake is done, and I think it is. Yes, it is. And here's the cake we just stuck in the oven a couple moments ago. Wow, that looks beautiful. Are there any vegan chefs that you like, other than obviously Mark? Oh, Mark, yeah. Um, not just, and I'm not just not just saying that. Mark is an inspiration, and he's a very humble person. He's a very inspired person, and uh, chef. And that to me is what uh, I really relate to. It's not anything other than the fact that he is a man of integrity and he's a man of passion about vegan food. And uh, as far as other chefs are concerned. Um, I worked with uh, Ken Bergeron, who's a very inspired chef. He went with my team one year and actually won a, a gold medal also. Uh, he's a very inspired chef, a uh, vegan chef. And, uh, Ken did the summer, well, did you know Chef Ron was a chef at Summerfest, AJ, and then before Ken, and then Ken did it for like 25 years before I did it. Yes, I do remember him the year before you came. We'd love to get him on the show. I do remember Summerfest with Chef Ken. That's fantastic. He's a, really, he's a really inspired chef too and a man of integrity. And... So why do so many chefs in restaurants yell? What, where did that come? I mean, like, where, where did that start? People, you know, chefs being yelling. Yelling? Yelling, yelling in the kitchen. Yeah, that's old school. That's old school. I know the chef, Willie Hate, who I worked as an executive pastry chef in Miami at an at a exclusive yacht club called Turnberry. And he was there. He told me about his apprenticeship in, in, in Switzerland. He became a certified uh, pastry chef and then certified cook. He went to two apprenticeship programs. He just said in the morning, the baker would come in if the oven wasn't quite hot enough. He'd be chasing them all with a, with, a, uh, with a rolling pin. I mean, that was crazy stuff. Today, it's leadership. That, that, that came from a very pompous chef attitude. Me, I'm the king of the kitchen and I'm going to you know, I, I saw that happen on one of the cruise lines. I was a guest chef on, and I saw this executive chef just tearing apart out of this poor apprentice. And it was very upsetting. So it's still out there a little bit, but for the most part, you don't pull a team together acting like that. You want good culinary uh, talent in your kitchen. You're not going to get that by beating up on it. You're going to get it by supporting it. Yeah, I don't feel you get the best work out of people when you're yelling at them. <laughs> yeah. So here's the, here's the egg. Um, right here. Now I'm gonna go next to actually plating. So we need to go next. Do you think that some, oh, oh sorry, go ahead. What I'm gonna do, you wanna get the, I need to step out of the freezer too. Yeah. Chef Ron is a master at plating also, AJ. Yeah, that you know, that's a that's as important, almost as important as how it tastes, right? Yeah. So people eat with their eyes. If it looks good, they'll try it. And if it doesn't, uh, 
Ninety percent of acceptance is you like the food. Um, I should say it's eye appeal, and ten percent uh, taste, and then it's ninety percent taste and ten percent eye appeal. It's like the eye appeal gets the customer draws them in. It's the taste that seals the deal. So you want it to taste look good to get them to try it to prove that it is good. But animal so, products are just so inherently not attractive. And not, I don't think it's just because I'm a vegan. I just don't think animal products look as good as plants. They don't have color. Yeah, exactly. And where does the color come from? It's the fresh fruits and vegetables. When I competed, when they had the first ever vegetarian category in the culinary Olympics in 96, I was the only one because you win based on points. So everybody could conceivably win a goal and everybody could conceivably win nothing. The only gold that was offered in that co and that only medal that was offered in that competition was the one that I won, which was a near perfect gold. I looked at all the food that all the other ones were doing, and it was all brown. Everybody was trying to create a piece of protein that looked brown, and they didn't have hardly any color in their food at all. All of my dishes in the Olympics are all loaded with a lot of color. I can send you some along the way if you wish. Um, let's see. Now. What I'm going to do next is take the, uh, I need a bunch of spoons. I need that, and then I need a bunch of spoons. Yes, a bunch of spoons. I need to spread the sauce out. While the sauce kind of a little thick, so what I'm going to do is spin it out. You can see it here, it's just a little thick. I'm going to put just a touch of water in it, just enough to. I put just enough water in there to kind of soften it up so that it will pour on the plate. I want it to pour. No, it's more like because the, the, the meringue has got a flow on this. So, what I want to do, what you do is, you, and again, when you're plating, what you want to look at the food you're serving. Now, this food doesn't have a lot of color. So, what I want to do is create a uh, uh, a frame that has color. So if you have a very basic food, very, uh, a food that doesn't have a lot of color, what you want to do is use a very colorful rim like I'm using here. So I'm going to spread this out. Yeah. Well, and next, I'm going to take a little raspberry puree. And I'm just going to accent one side of it. Okay? And I'm going to take a knife, a little uh, uh, it's a paring knife. And what I'm going to do is just pull this. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is just kind of pull this, but instead of going back and forth, I'm going to go like this. See the straight lines? The sauce has to be thick, and the coulis has to be thick, because you see those little fine lines coming in. That's a sign that, that the uh, consistency of the sauce is perfect. So now what I'm going to do is take, now I have the meringue that I just made, uh, and that was, uh, now I could just take that and scoop it onto it. But what I did here is I, what I did here is I um, took some of them and put them under the broiler. This is kind of giving that point I was trying to get at that these can need to so once you drop it, it's there. If it's not quite right, don't mess with it because if you do, you're going to mess it up. It's just the way it is. So now what I'm going to do is take that knife and I, what I have here is uh, called tipping nuts. I've got uh, I put 
put that between it because the sugar, uh, this is just caramelized sugar that I use as a garnish. So for, the, for those of you who don't need sugar, you just pull it off the, pull the garnish. Up. So what I'm going to do now is take the knife that I just sent down the table. I'm going to pump a little hole into this. And then I'm going to take, look at these pieces. That's all I do. I call it the hero, the piece that looks the best. Take a take a baby piece of that. And then maybe a little piece of uh, mint. I know I've got mint here somewhere. Wow, you're creating a masterpiece. People are asking where you got the beautiful plate, what kind it is. Thank you. Where did you get that plate, Chef Ron? Oh, uh, that was one, I don't remember. I got that when um, I was in New York City when I was in there uh, doing a presentation for a TV. And my wife, my lovely wife, Nancy, went out and purchased. So this is, this here is just a simple spring dessert. Just a cream glacé with a little raspberry coulis. And notice how that floats on the sauce. It's just sitting on it. It's so light that it, that's the whole idea behind it. That's what they call the floaty on. It's really almost too pretty to eat. And next, we're going to here. We'll do the... Uh, To keep it painted. Now, I can paint it too. There's my plate. Oh, no, that's the dessert. That's okay. So, for the zucchini pancake, what I'm going to do is I've got some black rice that I cook, just uh, cook it with just a pinch of salt. And I have my green here. But before I do that, when you play them, one of the things, again, this is going to be a colorful dish. So, I picked an Italian place, got just a really light green uh, uh, rim on it. What I'm gonna do is take a little bit of balsamic uh, uh, reduction. Now what a reduction is, it's just balsamic syrup, uh, balsamic vinegar, and I cook it down real slow for maybe an hour or two hours, uh, as long as it takes to turn it into a syrup. And then I take that and uh, use that on the dish, on the plate, it can be used in a lot of ways, but it's a really, and I touch it with that. Now I'm going to put the rice down. You can see why I did it the way I did it, because if I put the rice down first, that wouldn't work. So I want to put enough rice in there. Just enough to set the, and again, you don't have to use these. You can do it rough without the mold, but the mold kind of holds things in place. So now I'm putting the rice, as I'm putting it in there, I'm doing it on an angle. So when you see that come up, you're going to see that angle. And I do that so that when I lay the uh, zucchini pancakes on it, first of all, I want to take my vegetables. What was the stripe on the bottom of the bottle? What was the first sauce that you put under the rice? That, uh, that's just balsamic vinegar cooked down into a reduction. Oh, so reduction. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you mentioned balsamic vinegar because for being a guest on the show, you're going to get to two free bottles. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and you get to choose uh, over, I think it's probably over 30 flavors of a balsamic reduction. Oh, so. wonderful. Because I do have different flavors in my kitchen and I love it. Well, so, what do, so what I'm going to do is take the uh, peppers. I got some peppers that we roasted. Again, I just put these in the oven and roasted them. And then after I roasted them, I sweat them. And so I got some broccolini. This is where my color is going to come in here. I see this color, but nutrition too. I'm going to take the, try to find the best piece here. I think this is probably the better one. I'm going to set that on here. So I think that seems a little bit too large. Some pepper. Cut the pepper a little bit. Okay. 
and how big the leaf up. Take another piece and kind of put it across here. Cross ways. Wanna, I want to, I don't want to, when, when planting a dish, one thing I don't like to do is like, I look at it like a, a, a city landscape. It's very contrived. I don't want it to look contrived. I want it to look natural. I want it to look like you're looking at the, the Rocky Mountains or something. It's just the way nature creates it. So it doesn't need to be perfect, but you want to create some sense of discipline. And then I use something that's very artistic to do to, that says, hey, I know how to cook, like using the hip mass or the sugar or the way you lay it out. So you want that piece too. So now I'm ready to lay down a couple of the zucchini pancakes. On top of that, my... I can see why you won the, I can see just by your plating why you won the Culinary Olympics. And next, I think I wanted one thing that I hadn't bought in there. Where is that? Okay, that's my, I have a, a roasted pepper reduction. And the over, here it is. This is, this, is, um, this is basically the peppers. Some more spoons. Uh, this is what this looks like. Now this is, this is the, this version here is the um, body malt version. So I think body malt. Body malt's a little bit darker. So it, it, it kind of competes with the roasted pepper, but I, what I do to make this sauce, I take all of the juice from all of the peppers that I'm cooking, I'm gonna roast peppers in an oven, and then I take them out and I put them in a container to sweat them. But where they sweat, all that juice comes out. So I collect that over months and then I cook that down. And then I add to that some rice syrup. In this case, I use barley malt syrup. And, and uh, basically it's a very, very strong uh, pepper malt flavor on this one. So I'm going to take a little bit of that and just drizzle it right in here. I want it. So when you're eating this rice and you're eating all this stuff, you're going to get that wow flavor coming out. Just simple steam roasted vegetables, but this really sets it off. You're right. You really are a culinary artist. You could teach a class just in plating. It isn't. That's part of the art. That's the canvas. <laughs> do you do any other kind of art? Like, because I know a lot, a lot of times chefs have other artistic endeavors. They either play an instrument or maybe they paint. Do you do, you do anything else like that? Creative? Uh, I'm sorry, you want to run the button again? Do you have another outlet for creating art that you like to do other uh, than chefs? Uh, culinary? I like to paint but I just can't get back to it. And the other one that I like to do is uh, working with things like pastelage. Uh, it's basically a, it's, it's a white sugar dough. And I, I've made things like Stradivarius violins out of it, the Mayflower. I create the molds, cast the molds, and then I take the sugar, and then I cast that sugar um, into the mold to create whatever I want to create. So I created the, the separations for a wedding cake I'm using that. So it's a real creative, and then I cocoa paint on it. I do cocoa painting on marzipan, uh, and then I like to work with marzipan just to create the fruits and stuff. So yeah, there's a it, when you're talking about uh, culinary art, uh, it's like talking about the galaxies. <laughs> where do you start? And where do you end? Yeah, um, Chef Ron, Colleen wants to know how many other chefs participate in the Culinary Olympics. It's international. Uh, chefs from about forty different countries come there to compete. So the city just comes alive. The kitchens are going 24-7 for about seven days. And uh, people are showing, they got to show them several categories. Hot, cold, which is what I'm showing here. And then the cold, cold is like buffet. And then they have the pastry. And then they have the hot competition. The hot competition is only open to uh, national teams because uh, they couldn't handle it. Now. And the national team has to do uh, a dinner for 100 people and they have to do it in four hours, and they have a team of chefs and they have a, a kitchen to do it. Uh, they provide a kitchen and everything. It's a standard kitchen, everything is standard. There's four members on the team, and, and that's what they uh, do. As an independent original team, I could not compete in that. I could compete in all the other categories, and I competed in pastries and hot cold basically all, all five times. 
Did they televise the Culinary Olympics ever? Pardon me? Did they, Do they ever it? televise it? Uh, I don't, you can see stuff on, on YouTube. I don't think they do, unfortunately. It doesn't get the, it doesn't get the, the attention that the athletic Olympics gets. But it would be interesting if they did, because there would be eye opening uh, for people to see. And the food that comes off the Olympics is a food that ends up in America's table. You know, I, I saw like seafood sausage being said, oh, that's interesting. And the next thing you know, American restaurant menus are serving sure see, seafood sausage. So it's sort of a, uh, an incubator for culinary creation that translates like what I did with the cuisine into the American food service. So the final one here is going to be the cake. This is the final one. I got a little surprise after this too. This was what I planned on doing. Yeah. Let's go to see if the line on it. So let's pull that off. Um, let me do that. And now this is just fun. You can just take a piece of cake and cut it. I want to trim the ends. You can see that you can see this how this cake is spongy. That sponginess is the egg. You wouldn't get that in a regular vegan cake. I'm gonna, see, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do this, but I got an idea how I'm going to do it. So and that's the fun thing about creating. I know I got this plate. I know I got this piece. Like, oh, I want to present it. And cut the end off here too. It's coming right off. And I. Uh, to my size, portion size, I don't want to go too big. Uh, I don't want to go too big, so here we, I'm going to cut it like so, and then I'm going to cut it like so, and I'm going to put a piece down like this, and I'm going to put the other piece up like this. Now that's just, now you can see the cake on the plate and just put the square on, or you can do that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is Ice cream, fun part. Um, and I got the, this is the chocolate ice cream now. Now, uh, there's the two ice creams. This ice cream, I was not, this is what it looks like when it's whipped. I froze it and whipped it. Now, this one wasn't whipped. So you can see the lightness and the difference in the color. But this one has about 10% more air in it than this, than this one does. They both taste the same. They both have the same texture and mouthfeel. And one of the things I like to do when you talk about art and stuff, I like to collect antiques and I like to cook with them. Uh, and this is a scoop from about the turn of the century. It's about over 100 years old. This is what they used in ice cream shops when they had the old boardwalk type stuff. This, this is old. And I have a collection of that. I have a hose in my, in my uh my lab from the uh, from the 1920s. It was like the kitchen of the of that time. Everything was in that cabinet that they needed to cook with. So anyway, this is that scoop. And so it's I'm going to take a scoop of this. And I'm going to set this right here. I'm going to make that work. Who are the lucky people that get to eat all this today? Mark, Chef Mark, and Chef. James. Lucky. Uh, Diane this. says, what sparked your interest in the culinary world? In the culinary world, it was art. First of all, it was nutrition. I was a Franciscan monk for, for 22 years. And when I joined the order, um, I had to pick, I was a brother, so I had to pick a, uh, something that I wanted to get into. And I was, when I joined the order, it was over 200 pounds. So I said, you know, I need to lose some weight. So that got me in the kitchen, literally. My parents had a kitchen. They had a diner restaurant. I didn't want to work in it. I didn't want anything to do with it. And I, but the furthest I got there was washing dishes and uh, mopping the floor until the end, when I got interested in food coming back in the summer from the seminary, that's when I started getting into the food. But it was health that got me into it. And it was the art side of it that I explained earlier that came together and it just, there was like chemistry. So now I'm gonna create a, it's nice. 
take a scoop of avocado ice cream. Now, avocado ice cream, uh, there it is. Avocado ice cream is made with avocados. So it's avocados and more coconut, no coconut cream and uh, lemon juice and sugar. Well, I'm going to set this one. I'm going to get a good clean scoop. I don't think I've ever seen such beautifully plated food, like ever. Center there. So see how that's stacking up? See the interest in that construction? It's not it's creating natural height, natural texture, natural interest, and it's all just working with the ingredients that you're putting. Can you teach us how to do that with the food I eat, sweet potatoes and broccoli? How can I make that beautiful? Yeah. Be surprised what you can do with it. And the fun thing about working with these products is working with the food in general is that creation is uh, um, always at the forefront. Love to. I wish they would televise the Culinary Olympics the way they televise the regular Olympics. Yeah. What I wanted to do was, uh, was looking for my garnishes, and I had Mr. Don to put on for the garnish. So, what I'm going to do again is use some fresh. I'm sure here I got two different options. Something crisp. See, so when I do this, I'm going to make all these pieces. I just roll with the sugar. You know what this thing needs? It needs a crushed strawberry. Do you, do you have any recipes in any of your books for avocado ice cream? It's in my it's in my um, cookbook for um, classical vegetarian cookbook. Yeah. And we used did. we used Chef Ron's uh, cookbook in our curriculum here at the school. If people email if people email you, Chef Ron, can they get some of the recipes from today? Sure. Okay, and you guys, it's in the show notes. He's emailed them because the cookbook is called. Maybe show it one more time, Mark. Sandra's asking. Yeah, if, what it's if you're buying a cookbook, a lot of the just if you're buying a cookbook, the recipes are in the, a lot of the recipes are in the cookbook. And if you're buying the uh, egg, the cookbook is available on my website. If you're buying the um, egg mix, it's on Amazon. Just uh, type in Google. Um, Eco hyphen cuisine uh, egg and then uh, Amazon and then you'll you'll see it if you if you're interested in that and you'll get the recipes when you order those. But um, if you don't if you're not doing that, I just send you the recipes. No words. So what I'm going to do? Yeah, it's not working. Out. I'm trying to figure out what's going to work here before the ice cream melts. So I think what I'm going to do is go with just some fresh milk, get in the cap on the milk. The cap is always the most, most interesting part. Get this piece right up on top and you can pull as many of these back and leave as many on as you want. And sitting that right in there seems to do that. And then we'll cap that off with a piece of should I think this would hold up better. The reason I say that it's thicker. This is going to fill out the soft real quick. And there you have it. Now, we got one final dish. 
this is springtime. You can notice I didn't have any fresh fruit. I mean, I had the raspberry cream uh, sat around and I'm using in the, with this particular dish. And, but I didn't have any fresh whole fruit. So what I did here is I made, I, made a, I took a fresh mango, fresh pineapple, fresh raspberries, fresh strawberries, and I mixed them all together with a little mango puree. Uh, and the juices from that added just a tad of sugar with some instant starch, which would thicken up instantly. And then a touch of lemon juice to bring up the flavors. So what I'm going to do with that now is bring a savion sauce over here. Now this is just silken tofu with agave. This is sugar free, this is salt free, this is fat free. It's just silken tofu. And silken tofu is more of a dessert tofu. It doesn't have the off notes of the traditional tofu. So it really works well with cheesecakes and things of that nature. What I did is I blended that with Peru strawberries. And what I did is, a, sorry, raspberries. And I did strain the raspberries. I just let, let, let the seeds right in. So I'm going to take that and place that on the, uh, I'm not going to put a lot on it. I'm just going to put a dollop right in the center. I don't want to cover up the fresh fruit too much. And then to that, now this is where the hip and moss comes in. Hip and moss is uh, basically an almond paste uh, with white flour, and I use an egg, uh, egg replacement. I use the energy egg replacement. And this is a recipe in the book, but it's also uh, one that I developed back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So I'm going to take that and then put that right in here. Again, with a piece of mint, it's just a small piece this time. I love fresh fruit. And what I do with fresh fruit during the summer is we always keep a lot. If it's, if it's getting away from us, what I do is I throw it in the freezer and then I pop them out and make smoothies with it. it makes excellent smoothies. So, fresh fruit salad with raspberry savion and hip and moss. Wow, oh, you are really a chef chef. You're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chef Mark, for the great recommendation. And so he had, what classes do you teach at Mark's school? Mark? <laughs> uh, chef, chef Ron has been, he's been a guest presenter for uh, our Mother Sauce Day. Uh, we have a day that goes through uh, analog products, so tempeh and seitan. Uh, he's... Uh, doing a, a, he's a master with uh, legumes as well. So we have a legume focus day and a pastry day. And then I believe a, a analog and sauce day. So for five, five days this semester, we've had the, the honor and privilege of having Chef Ron uh, share with our students and they all, they're all uh, very happy to uh, be in the same kitchen with him. It's, it's really an honor. And, and uh, I was a certified uh, culinary educator, I should say. I'm a taught in Florida in the culinary schools there in Bokehead and in high school. And then I taught in Milwaukee also. So I love teaching. And what brought me to the school, as I said, Mark, and I, and I mean that because I know what's really passionate about it. I know it's really clean vegan food. It's not uh, some pseudo uh, version of it. And um, for me, it's giving back. I mean, all my, my last instructor, Mr. Peavy, was one of my inspir inspirations in the, in the, in, in the uh, culinary education. This guy was a genius with food. He just passed away because of COVID. And um, in a way, uh, all of my chef's instructors passed away. The last one passed away this year. And I remember how much they gave to me and how much they're pouring their talent and their energy to me meant to me. And so part of all of this that's been given to me, it's part of giving back. And that's why I love to teach students. They're inspired. Someday, some of these students that Chef Mark's teaching are going to be beyond where I'm at. You know, so all I'm doing is trying to create something so people can take it and run with it far beyond where I've taken it. I'm just kind of creating the, that's why I look at Antoine Parham. He's creating the basis and I'm kind of creating that here too with what I'm doing. Along with a lot of other chefs, I don't want to say that there are other chefs that are doing some really creative work. 
But what I'm doing is trying to create something that somebody can build on. And I want to teach that. And part of building on it is teaching. Wow. Well, you do it very well. Diane wants to know, did you ever have a restaurant? I, um, no, I didn't, but I worked at some very interesting ones. I went to Milwaukee in 1980, opened up a restaurant there called the Renaissance. We had people lined up around the block to come eat there. And then I went from there to um, Florida and I worked at the Unicorn, which is now part of Whole Foods. And then I went to work at a small ashram restaurant. And that was one of the funnest restaurants I ever worked at. It was run by an ashram and I was living in the ashram as a Franciscan. And uh, it was just every day was created with food. We had a, a classical French pastry uh, shelf and did uh, macro dinners one night, and classical French one night. And it was just, it was, and so I, I was executive chef there. Uh, those three different places as far as executive chef, but I've worked in rest, uh, hotels doing a lot of caterings and special events for hundreds of thousands of people. So I moved around, but never as an executive chef, but it just kind of stepped in and stepped out. Wow. Well, you are, uh, you are extraordinary. And people are saying you should teach a class just in plating. I would take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure yeah. and an honor to, to do this class. With oh you. my was, God. No, the, I mean, man, you, you, I, you're such a good chef. You could even yell at me in the kitchen. I wouldn't even care. You're so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so you'll be coming back. We already have a date in September. And I know, Mark, you're going to be coming back too as, 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 as a chef. So that, and you could have other, you can have, you know what we should do, Mark? Honestly, I just thought of this. We should just do like a whole week devoted to your school and just have a whole week of all your instructors. That would be, uh, that would be cool. We would, we would love that. That would be wonderful. Yeah, because I'm starting to do, I mean, it's not that I'm running out of guesses, but I'm starting to do these theme weeks. Like I had Victoria Moran on for a whole week, but she had a different student on every day. And I'm doing that with lifestyle medicine. So we should just do, I mean, we can keep your days, but we should just do a whole week just, and then each week you can have a different teacher, a different instructor from your school. I would love that. Thank you, AJ. Are you kidding? It's my pleasure. I love, I mean, this is, I feel like the Don King of vegan. I love promoting just wonderful people that are doing really, that's like I say, doing great things in the world. So um, do you think Summerfest will be on next, next year, Mark, for you to be back as the executive chef? Well, this year, you know, they're, they canceled it this year. So I'm not sure we're in dialogue. So okay. I'd, well, I'd like to be back there. Yeah, yeah, you, you do that. You're just always walking around like so chill. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you again, Chef, Chef Ron. You are fabulous. You're welcome. Thank and you we'll, take, right, my take pleasure. Care, AJ. Thank you. And thanks so, all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow it. for Mother's Day when my guest is none other than our resident psychologist, Dr. Doug Lyle. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.